All right. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever uh, time zone you happen to be in. My name is James Churchill. I'm a teacher here at Treehouse, and I'm going to be doing some live coding today, uh, filling in for Kenneth Love. So I live streamed a couple of months ago, and we did some ASP.NET Core and Angular, and we started building, uh, well, we'll take a look at what that app was that we were building, but basically what today is gonna be is more or less a continuation of what we, where we left off um, from that live stream back in May, I believe it was, like May 19th or something like that. So if you weren't aware, there is a repo, a GitHub repo that contains the source code uh, where we left off that project at the end of the last live stream. Oh, before we get too much farther into it, uh, be sure to chat questions. Um, I'll be doing my best to watch the chat that's going on. And so if you have questions, obviously interrupt me, let me know what they are, and I'll do my best to answer them. But uh, let's start by taking a quick look at the app as it was that we left off, talk about what it is that we were trying to build, and then uh, I'll quickly just kind of run down what we'll attempt to do today as we continue working on this application. Excellent. So like I said, there is a repo. It's up on the Treehouse organization. Uh, it is a public repo. Uh, so you can, let me zoom in to the, uh, hang on here. Okay. So we've got, it's live stream, ASP.NET Core Angular is the name of the repo. Um, I've got some notes here in the readme file if you want to check those out if you uh, didn't see the previous. Basically what we're doing is we're building, um, the app itself is a very simple idea. It's just a very basic CRUD, you know, create, read, update, delete, single page application. And we'll be using ASP.NET Core for the API uh, on the back end, and we'll be using Angular 4 for the client, the single page app that's going to be running in the browser. Uh, we're building this around video games just because we needed something to be able to display data about and allow users to add data. Uh, so that's what we picked. Very simple, something probably that most of us can relate to. And our API will have a Git, zoom in a bit here. It'll support a Git to get a list of records. We'll be able to pass in an ID to a Git request to get a single record. Uh, and we'll work today on adding the post so that we can add a new record from the app, from the, the, the Angular application. And eventually we'll get around to doing a put, which will update a record, and a delete, which will allow you to delete a record. Uh, we're using uh, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core. So this is fully cross-platform. And in fact, at the time, we're, we're just using in-memory data. We're doing, we don't even have a database. So it's, it's not really the way you would build a production app, but it's just allowing us to kind of, for the time being, ignore that part of the application just so we can be, be building kind of the overall structure of our app. In a future live stream, maybe next week, because I am doing the next couple weeks as well, uh, we'll take a look at something like Entity Framework so we can add actual data persistence to our application. Uh, that might be something that we'll consider to do. But for now, everything is in-memory data. As you'll see, it's, it's really simple, not really, again, the way you would do it in real life. On the front end, we're using uh, Angular 4, version 4, uh, for the front end client. Uh, we'll include, right now we, we just have one screen or one page that displays uh, a simple list of video games. Uh, we'll keep that and then we're going to add to it today an add form so that we can add a video game. And then eventually, you know, we could get around to editing a video game and adding the ability to delete so that we kind of have that full CRUD, you know, app experience. Okay. So the way that our current dev flow is set up, we, we kind of were rushing at the end of it because we were running tight on time. And we ended up with a situation that's not really ideal. Actually, you know what, before we get into this, let me go ahead and just run the application. I went ahead and cloned this repo. Let me zoom out a little bit here. Oops, let me get the current window. So I went ahead and cloned this repo down to my local machine. Uh, and that's this documents GitHub live stream ASP core Angular directory or folder. 
And if we take a look at that, uh, you'll see it has a readme file, resources. Um, I've been putting links in there to things um, as we kind of are using tooling and whatnot. So you can look in there uh, to see you know, links to, to additional information. Uh, so uh, ROL, uh, you asked, um, what MacBook are you using or recommending to program with? Uh, I, this is like a two-year-old MacBook Pro. It's not the new latest one, um, but it's a decent machine. It's got like 16 gigs of RAM and uh, I forget, like a 500 gig hard drive. Um, in the previous live stream, we were actually using Windows 10. That's one of the cool things about .NET Core and ASP.NET Core is that it's cross-platform. So this repo, if you happen to be on a Linux machine, uh, Mac OS, or Windows, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can just clone the repo and make sure you have the tooling installed, which would be the .NET Core CLI and the Angular CLI, and then things like Node and whatnot. And you can get up and running uh, regardless of what platform you're on. So that's nice. You don't you don't no longer need Windows to do ASP.NET development. So all of the source code lives in the SRC folder. So let's just go in there and there are three folders. There's a client app, a console app, and a web app. The console app was where we started. We created a very basic, just basically hello world console app just to show how the .NET Core CLI works. We're not going to cover that again today because we talked about that in the previous live stream. If uh, you want to check that out, go watch the first week and we walked through how to get set up and started with .NET Core and how to use the, the .NET Core CLI to create your project. But we're going to take a look right now. Uh, we'll go into the web app and that's the ASP.NET Core API. And so from here, we can just use uh, the .NET Core CLI, which is .NET, very easy to remember. So we can say .NET, and the first time that you do this on your machine, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to do .NET Restore. And what this does is it takes a look at all of our dependencies for our project and it downloads those. Uh, so we have those locally on our machine. And then once we've done a .NET Restore, we can do a .NET Build. ASP.NET Core is a compiled, uh, you know, it, it has a compiler for the C-sharp language, so uh, it's not just interpreted runtime. You actually have to compile the files into binaries, which we just did. And then once we've built, we can say .NET run. And .NET run basically starts up our local web server. And as you can see here, we're now able to browse to localhost 5000. So let's do that. So localhost. 5,000, and here's the first area. And we're actually gonna work on fixing this. Notice that I didn't supply, I didn't supply a, you know, my function key is not working. It's really annoying right now. <laughs> it's just type in an eight. So I'm not sure what's up with that. All right, I keep trying to zoom in and I press control option eight, which should allow me to do that. And it's just not working. Let me try one more time. Nope, <laughs> it's not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna try to debug it, it's, it's okay. So localhost 5000, um, we're trying to browse to the root of the application and it's coming back and saying page not found. Uh, we'll fix this error. Uh, we have a way to be able to configure ASP.NET Core so that it will look for default files. In other words, it'll look for a page called index.html. Right now we have to type that. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that and here is our Angular application. Uh, the way we have it currently set up is you have to click this button that then goes and makes a call to our API, our backend, to get the list of video games, which we only have uh, two video games that we're returning. And we'll, let's go take a quick look at what that API controller looks like, just so that we um, are all on board. So if you go into, oh, by the way, this is Visual Studio Code. So because I'm on a Mac, they actually have Visual Studio for Mac now, but I really like using code. It's it's a very lightweight editor, uh, so it's you know about 100 megabytes to install. Uh, it, it's if you think of it as as not like a full blown IDE like IntelliJ or or uh, WebStorm or something like that. This is more like Atom, for instance, um, but it, it's it's a really nice fast editor. So API controllers, video games controller. And so this is, this is what our Angular application is making a get request against to get the list of video games. And you, so the method that it's actually calling is this one right here. 
I'll zoom in a bit on this. So it's it's calling git. The git request gets mapped to this git method. You can see that we're saying this this should be mapped to an HTTP git method or verb. We call these attributes in C sharp, by the way. If if you haven't done a lot of C sharp development, putting this attribute on this method uh, tells uh, ASP.NET Core that this should be this method should be associated with git requests. And then we're basically just saying, hey, return a status of OK, which is 200, and return the video games. And that video games is just a private field that's a list of video game. And so you, you, can, you can see here the data that we're returning. And we're seeing these, these two titles uh, over in the browser right here. OK. All right, so what we want to do, let's let's start with, let me check my notes here, but I think the, probably the place to start is maybe updating, well, let's fix that default file first because that, that's super annoying. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to, to know that you have to type index.html. Uh, we, we, we want to be able just to browse to the root of the application uh, the, or the root of our website and have the correct page loaded. And I tried to do this in the last live stream, and sometimes you know when you're coding, you just get things in front of you, and you you just like you can't see what you're doing wrong, even if it's super simple. Um, and I, we actually had a, a, one of our watch our watchers, our viewers, post a comment on YouTube. So I want to thank them for doing that, um, and they pointed out my error, which again um, probably should have been obvious, but sometimes these things are just hard to see when when you're coding. So let's go in. We're going to go into the web app, and it, what it has to do with is in here we have a startup.cs file inside of our web app folder. And this is the configuration for our ASP.NET Core application. Down here, it has two, two methods. Configure services, which allows us to configure service that are, services um, that our application can use. Here we're just adding one MVC because we're using the MVC framework. And then we have a configure method. And what configure is responsible for doing is for configuring our middleware pipeline. ASP.NET Core has a middleware pipeline similar to how like um, Node.js, if you're, if you're used to doing like a combination of Node.js and Express, you have this idea of middleware. So when a request comes in, the first middleware hand processes the request, the second middleware does, the third middleware, and so on, uh, how many you have configured. And then the last one returns, or one of those will return a response back up through the rest of them. Hang on here. I had an alarm set. OK, great. So again, middleware. So what this is doing is configuring some middleware. Uh, and down here, we had a middleware to process static files. Without this middleware, you actually can't serve like static files, like CSS files from your server. So you have to have this middleware if you're going to do that. So we have that here. And then I added a call to the use default files middleware. But the problem here is, is that, again, because we're building up our middleware pipeline, that needs to be done before the static files middleware is invoked. And the reason for that is, is use default files is modifying the request. So this middleware looks at the request, looks at the path, and says, oh, they didn't supply a path. They just supplied slash to get to the root of the website. And then it goes through some you know, logic, some code, to figure out if a default file should be used. And it actually modifies the request then to say, oh, he has an index.html default file. The user or the, the whoever's making the request is asking for the root, so I'm going to change the request to load index.html. So having it the original way I had it was failing because the request wasn't being modified before the static file middleware had a chance to serve the file. We need to make sure it's before. So that one simple change, and now we should be able to come back out to our terminal. We'll stop the server. We'll do .NET build. Remember, we're, we're we're developing in C Sharp ASP.NET here, so we made a change. So we would build, and then we would say .NET run. Now we'll start up the server again. OK, we're running again. So now if we come back out here, and we browse to the root, 
blah, and we get our index.html without having to browse directly to it, which is what we wanted it to be all along. And again, I just I had the middleware in the wrong order. Now we could still browse directly to index.html if we wanted to. It doesn't mean we can't. It just means that in the future, if we deploy this website to you know AWS or Azure or Google Cloud um, or some web host, and we have a custom domain name like rcoolvideogames.com or, or whatever that is, then someone could just browse to rvideogames.com and they would get to our homepage, which is our only page in our application since we're doing an Angular single page app and it would load up the app. Okay, so that's our first change that we're going to do. Pretty simple stuff, but important because we wanted <laughs> we wanted to fix that. Um, all right, so the next thing I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about, remind everyone where we left off of our, what I would call our development flow. So like I mentioned just a minute ago, our source code is, is well, you know, we, we can ignore this console app because it, it's not really playing a role here. In fact, I'm just going to, I'm just going to get rid of it just to, to eliminate confusion. The console app wasn't doing anything for us anymore. It was just where we started as a test. So we have our client app, which is our Angular application, and we have our web app, which is our ASP.NET Core backend API. So the, the client app, we're using Angular CLI, or we used Angular CLI to, to create that, that project, and we're using that to, as you'll see in a minute, to start the local server to host that, or to build it, and to um, host that content as we're developing. But the way that we, we are getting our client files over to our web app is we're having to do an ng build. And ng build basically takes all the JavaScript, and, or it's actually TypeScript, TypeScript, compiles it down to the JavaScript, bundles, bundles it all together, and then basically copies all of those folders, all of those files, all the way over to our web app, which is our ASP.NET app, into www.root. www.root is a special folder in ASP.NET Core where all of your static assets are served from. And so if you look in there, you can see that we have this index.html index and these JavaScript files. These JavaScript bundles here are coming from that ng build. That, that is our bundled Angular application. Now, the problem here is that if we make a change to our Angular app, we have to run ng build every time in order to get these files over to our ASP.NET Core app, which is then, I'll remind you, you know, we're we're running, well, I'm not running right now, <laughs> but if we were in the like we were doing before, we were doing .NET run. Ideally, what what I'm getting at, ideally what we want to have to not do is every time we make a change to our client. We don't want to have to run ng build because it's not a super quick command, to be perfectly honest. Let, let's, let's check out how long it takes to do that. So I'm going to go over to our client app. And then I'm going to say ng build. And I'm going to say I want a production build. And so that's going to, ng is the Angular CLI. So that's, the, and build is the command to, it compiles the TypeScript, the JavaScript, it, does some optimization, bundles everything together. And you can see here that, that it created four JavaScript files. So there's a bun there's two bundles, there's two more bundles, and a CSS bundle as well. And it copied all of those over to this www root folder. That's what, where these files are coming from. So Having you saw that it wasn't instantaneous. That's super annoying, right? I mean, as you're as you're working on the Angular application, we're going to be making changes and wanting to just basically see our changes in the browser and not have to run that command. So let's fix this. The reason why I took this approach was because I was trying to avoid having to deal with cross-origin requests with our API. Right now, the way that we have our API configured, it will only allow requests if it's coming from the same domain. And what we mean by that. Let me do this. Actually, I'm just going to open up a new file here. So for instance, our Angular application, if we were to type ng serve and serve our Angular application, 
it's going to serve that from local local host 4200. So this is our Angular app. And then if we run, so this is, uh, we say ng serve, not server, ng serve. And then our Angular app will be running at that URL. And then if we say .NET run to run our API, it would be served here. Two different servers. We have the Angular CLI has a server that's going to host and run our Angular application. And we have the .NET Core CLI uh, that has Kestrel, which is its own web server, that it uses to, to host and run ASP.NET Core applications. And so that's what that's what is here. So this is our ASP.NET Core API. And even though it doesn't look like it, because they're both using localhost, because the port number is different, it's a different domain. And you you can't, without some additional configuration, you can't you can't make an API request across domains for security reasons. But we can change the configuration of our ASP.NET Core API to allow this. I was trying to avoid having to do that configuration, so what I was doing is I was copying the Angular files into the ASP.NET Core project, so they were both both sets of uh, the Angular app was being served from the ASP.NET Core server, so it was in the same domain, which just kind of made it simpler. But it makes hassle and makes our lives as developer more difficult, so it really wasn't worth it. So let's let's do this. Let's so what we have to do to start with is we have to enable cores, something called cores, C O R S, cross origin requests, for our ASP.NET Core API. Now, I do this so infrequently. Um, in fact, I, I I don't know. I can't remember the last time I did it specifically with ASP.NET Core. So I'm gonna have to go look it up. This is a, a common thing that, that we do, of course, as developers. So let's look that up. Let's say ASP.NET Core cores. And our first match is, of course, what we're looking for. So enabling cross-origin requests. Perfect. That is exactly what we're looking for. And this, this documentation does a great job, actually. It, it explains what, what, what I just talked through. What is same origin? And then it goes on to talk about how to set up cores. So the first thing we need to do is we need to add this package uh, to our ASP.NET Core application because it's it's not it's not there by default. We have to go in and add it. So I'm going to go into my web app CS proj. I'm zoomed in it's super big here. So I did that kind of fast. So inside of the web app folder. I'm going to collapse this down so it's a little simpler. There is this .csproj file. This is our project file for our ASP.NET Core application. One of the things inside of here are the packages that our application uh, is relying upon. So we can add additional package reference. So we can say package reference include, and then I copied that namespace that microsoft.aspnetcore.cores ASP namespace. And then we need to say what the version is here. Uh, you know, I don't know what the latest version is. So let's, let's go check it out. We can actually just go s find that package on NuGet and see what the latest version is. So we'll say NuGet, and we'll search specifically, and here it is. It looks like 1.1.2 is the latest version. So NuGet, if, if you um, have done JavaScript development and you're familiar with NPM, so let's, uh, let's go check that out. So NPM, NPM is a package manager for JavaScript allows you to bring in packages and add, you know, you can basically leverage third-party code inside of your application, which is something that you do all the time, right? NuGet is a package manager for .NET and ASP.NET. And so this is where we go get packages to be able to add, uh, you know, functionality to our application. 
So we can go here, we can look at information, we can see what dependencies need to be there, which we don't really have to worry about. That stuff will get handled for us automatically. What I was looking for was this version number. So 112, which is what everything else is. I probably could have just taken a guess, but we wanted to know for sure. So now that we've added that package, we can come back out to the terminal. And you know what, I'm gonna leave this prompt See, where am I at right now? So I'm in the client app. Let's go over to, let's do a second app or a second prompt here. Let's see. In fact, I'm gonna leave that one up because we'll come back to that in a second. But I'm gonna open up a second tab. And let me, let me get to my GitHub repo here. So CD source, web app. Okay, so now we're in the root of our web app folder, which is where we want to be if we're going to, to do any .NET Core CLI, run the .NET Core command. So we would say .NET, and we need to do a restore because we added a new package, so .NET restore. Oh, hey, the project file could not be loaded. Package reference start tag does not match. Uh-oh, what did I do here? Ah, super simple. <laughs> this is uh, XML. XML, you'll notice that, that, that it has angle brackets like HTML, so it has elements and attributes. This is an element, of course. This is an attribute, but I forgot this is a self-closing tag or element, as, so I didn't have the slash there, which it is. the document has to be well-formed. So it was it luckily it gave me a, a pretty good uh, error message there that my silly mistake. All right. So now we can see here that, that it went and did a restore. And we should be able to, well, let's go back to our instructions and see what's next. Okay, so we need to, in our configure services, we need to say add cores. And let's, so let's do that. We'll go into setup. So that's our, our excuse me, our startup.cs file in the root of our web app folder. So we'll say enable cores. So services, add cores. Okay. We have a, uh, a motion sensor light in this room. <laughs> it's really great. You'll see about every so often, let's see, that was about every, about every 30 minutes. It's gonna turn off. So you'll see me kind of reach over here and wave uh, so that we I can turn the lights back on. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we added cores as a service. So there's some there's some code, or a, you know, there's a service defined inside of that cores package that we added that we need to make available to our application. And so that's what this services add cores does. And then we're, we also need to configure it. Remember our middleware pipeline. So we we need to make a modification there. So in fact, in, our, in the instructions, it specifically says that right, enabling cores of middleware. And so we're going to do this. We're going to add this line of code. We need to do this before anything that that, that would. So for instance, we need to make sure that's before use MVC, which is the very last middleware component that we have, because Chorus is going to modify the request, um, or actually, it's probably the response. It may look at the request and the response now that I think about it, but basically it has to, to do what it's going to do uh, before MVC gets a chance to handle the request. So we're going to say app use cores that adds the cores middleware to the pipeline, and then we get handed a builder. So this builder, uh, this is a, uh, a Lambda or an anonymous function. So we can pass that function or that method in Builder is a parameter here, and then we can say builder. And then with origins, this would allow us to, um, we should be able just to put in here localhost 4200. I believe we can also say builder with, oh, and now I'm not, with headers. There's one that allows you to say allow, maybe it's allow any origin. Yeah, okay. So we can say builder allow any origin. And that would just make our, uh, oops, I was a little aggressive there with removing the last parenthesis. <laughs> 
there. And we can just put this all on one line. It makes it a little bit easier to read. So we'll allow, allow any origin. Basically, it's, it's what it sounds like. Any, any request coming from any domain would be allowed. If you're going to do this in production, you probably ought to have, this is like if you've ever used an API, uh, a third-party API and you have to go get a token, you're going to want to set up some sort of like a token authentication so that you know, you know, that the person making a request has like registered with you as an application provider, an API provider, some way of identifying them. Um, unless you truly, truly are serving up like very, very public data, it's probably not something you want to do. But we actually can, we could do this. We could say if, I don't know if I'm asking for, okay, so we are. So this configure method has an iHosting environment uh, parameter. So we can say if environment is development. And then we could add this cores. Oh, and that's a method, not a property. So now what this is doing is it's saying if our environment is development, meaning not staging, not production, then we want to add support for cores. Uh, that, that would be an option. We could certainly do that. Uh, trying to think. We probably want to, since we're going to have to also decorate our controller with an attribute, let's just go ahead and just add it all for now. And then, um, well, you know what? Let's, let's, let's go back to using the method that, that is uh, a little bit more. And what was that use origin? What was the, the less specific or the more specific uh, with origins? So builder with origins, and this takes uh, an, uh, basically with array params, so we can add as many as many origins as we want here. Uh, we only have the one, so I'm going to say local host 4200. But we we could add we could add more if we wanted to here, if we had multiple domains that we for some reason wanted to accept requests from. Okay. So now that we've done that, let's go back to our instructions. Um, yeah, I think all that else is fine. Uh, and so now we need to go in and you can do it per action. You can enable cores only for specific API methods. So if you want it to be really granular about you know which methods you were going to support, you could do that. Um, but we're going to do it per controller. So let, let's let's enable cores here. And I, I'm trying to think, allow specific origin. Uh, I think we can just, because we don't have, um, you could refer to these origins by name too. So if you wanted to say, oh, you know, this controller could, could be accessed by this origin. This other one could be accessed by a different origin. You could do that. We just want to say enable cores. So let's go to our API controller, which is under API controllers folder, which is arbitrary. You could not put it in a folder. You could put it in a folder named controllers. And I'm going to put that up here. Attributes don't have to, uh, they can appear in any order. OK, and we're going to be missing a namespace. So let's see here. using. Microsoft, take it as take a stab there, where that that is. Uh, did that not work? Infrastructure. Mm, interesting. Maybe it's still catching up. Looking here to see. No, 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 no. Is there a complete code example? All right, still not happy with me. Uh, so we have to we have to put in a policy name. So I got the right namespace. Um, so I uh, I did that kind of fast. Let's let's back that up again. So if I comment out that the, the error that we were getting with that red squiggly underneath there said that hey I, I don't know what enable cores what that attribute is. Um, 
So I added using Microsoft ASP.NET Core cores, which is the name of the package. It just happens to be the name of the namespace as well. Looked like it did do anything, but it actually did. Now, now we're saying that um, there isn't a version of this. Basically, what it's saying is that we we have to pass in uh, what this is. So let, let's go back to our startup file, and with origins, it's interesting. I'm not giving it a name. So the current policy builder, do I just pass in default? How do you get to? Okay, so let's. Clearly, I'm not understanding the naming or the scoping of this. Second approach is to define one or more named core policies and then select a policy by name at runtime. Uh, you know what? I wonder if we even, when using MVC to enable course, the course is sort of but the course middleware is not. You can use MVC to apply specific course per action prefer. Allow specific origin. Named policy, allow specific origin. Um, yeah, I don't want to. So you can configure cores for all controllers. Well, let's do this. Let's see. Well, now I'm probably, I'm definitely going to need this. So let's, we need to, so what I'm going to do is we're basically, we're going to add what's known as the ASP.NET Core filter. A filter has a chance to, to again, modify the, the request of response before the action itself, the method that's called in the controller. So we can basically go in here and when we are configuring our core service, okay. So let's try taking this out. So services configure MVC options and we're missing we're missing our namespace. So let's do this. Let's say using Microsoft ESP cores. No, that didn't help either. Wow. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I will say. Visual Studio proper does a much better job at telling you where these things. Okay, so using well, you know what, look at that. It allowed me to add the missing namespace. So I was just about ready to say <laughs> that that's a feature that I miss is when it's a namespace, notice this, we're getting this little light bulb here. I think you can click on the light bulb uh, and you can add the missing using statement. So let me let me do that one more time because if you run into this, uh, you know, you, you're, you're probably going to initially do what I did there. And I was like, uh, what is the namespace? I don't remember these things off the top of my head all that often. Some of them you do, some of them you don't. Um, so it says type or namespace MVC options cannot be found. You can click on this light bulb icon for basically it's like a quick fix, or you can press, I'm on the Mac, so it'd be command period, or if you were on a Windows machine, it'd be control period. Uh, to an, it's the same action as clicking on that without having to take your hands off the keyboard. And then we can say here, ah, it knows that if we, if we add a using directive to the Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC namespace, that will basically make that type available to this code file without having to fully qualify it. The other option would be is that we, we could fully qualify that. Uh, what I mean by that is that if we took the using, the using directive off here, uh, we could just refer to it by its full namespace. We could say, oh, that's Microsoft, ASP.NET Core, MVC, MVC options is where that lives. But that gets a little tiring. Or it just adds verbosity, you know, to your code that you probably don't want to have. So adding the using uh, directive for the for the namespace helps you know make your code a little cleaner and more concise. Okay, so we have that. So let's take a look here. So services configure MVC options, options, options filters. So basically, we're we're getting uh, a handle to the to the options for the MVC framework. Now, you know, I think I've, I might have made a mistake. No. Okay. 
So, uh, which allows us then, or it gives us a way to get to the filters collection so that we can say cores authorization filter factory. Uh, and here, uh, you know, it keeps wanting to, you know, I wonder if, let's see here, so services, what was the name of that? Uh, add cores, add cores. Let's 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 do some testing here. I, I'm unsure as to, as to whether or not we need to have a named policy, and I'm not seeing in in the example here. Um, maybe I'm just staring right at it again, but I'm not seeing. It's not super clear. To select the pol, this example adds a core. Yeah, we don't want. We don't really want to use a named. So we allow any header here. That's what we were. That's what we're doing, I believe. Still, let's double check that. Yep, our builder with origins. So we have a specific origin. Okay. Okay, and then we are adding cores up here. So let's let's go ahead and build and run this and see if we can make a request from a different domain. Let's just test it. Let's kick the tires a little bit. All right, so we're inside of our, oops, not KS, LS. We're inside of our web app, so let's do a .NET build. Okay, and .NET run. Okay, and then from our client app now, let's just do ng serve. So now we're using the Angular CLI starting up its, its development server, which is going to then allow us to browse to localhost 4200 once it's done bundling everything. So let's go to localhost. Okay, so let's open up our development tools so we can see if there's any, any errors or anything that happens when we Click get video games. Oh, API video games 404 not found. Interesting. So it didn't outright, outright reject the request, but it also isn't finding it. So let's see here. So localhost 5000. Oh, <laughs> don't think. Oh, hey, look at that. So we got an exception. So a course policy named empty string could not be found. All right, so it looks like it wants us to name the policy. Um, there may be a way to get around um, doing, doing this whole naming thing. Uh, I'm not specifically seeing it. So let's, let's do this. I'm going to, We'll leave this here for now in case we want to globally add this to all of our controllers. So I'll put a, a little to do saying we do want to remove this. And let's, let's go back to our example and let's just follow, let's follow their example of naming things. So where was it at here? Okay, so we can, we can add services, add cores, add policy, and then down here we can so let's, let's use this. I don't, I don't know what it is that I'm not seeing about that other example. We'll get this working. Didn't think we'd spend so much time on this, but this is kind of sometimes the way things go. All right, so now we're doing, so let's, let's kill this guy, or let's comment out services. Oh, dang it. What is going on? Okay, so we'll comment him out. So now we're saying services add cores and we're getting the options for cores and we're saying add policy. Uh, and we'll just, I don't know, we'll just call this um, dev, the dev policy <laughs> builder. And then um, oh, we'll, we'll use our specifics. So we'll say local host 4200, okay. Then down here we say use cores and we say which, which policy. OK, 
Okay, so use cores. And we say dev. Okay. Uh, now let's let's build that and see. I still think we're gonna need to add the attribute, but let's well, let's double check. So .NET build. Let's try to do the minimal amount of code still that we can. And then uh, .NET run. Okay. And then let's go back to our Angular app here and try making a request again. Okay, so we still got an error, still got not found, probably got another exception. Okay, so cores policy named block cannot be found. Now let's let's add the attribute and see if that makes a difference. So going back here, oh, you know what? <laughs> now now I'm wondering if that attribute was if we had it set up correctly before <laughs> all along. Uh, so let's, I forgot that I, I left that attribute on there on the controller. So I took that attribute off. Let's, let's undo this a little bit here. So let's, cause let's, let's make sure that our original test was in fact valid. Silly me. So we'll say use cores. Ah, we really got to go back. So I'm going to undo this. Okay. So that was our original code there. And then up here, we'll roll this back too. And then we'll just add. Okay, so now we're going back to our original attempt. Services add cores. And then we had our builder with a specific. So let's let's just build and run this and see. So .NET build, .NET run. <coughs> Okay, server is up and running. We'll refresh this guy. We'll say get video games. <sighs> okay, so as it turns out, we don't need the attribute. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, postulate here that that the attribute is only necessary on the controller or methods if you have named policies. So that's probably where I was getting hung up. That I scrolled down to that example and thought, oh, I need to put an attribute on the controller. Right now, we're just globally um, enabling cores in our pipeline, our middleware pipeline, so that every request comes in, looks for uh, the, the, the header that it's looking for, and then it's then writing the header that needs to be there that says that cores or cross origin requ requests are enabled um, for localhost 4200. So let's, let's do some cleanup. Let's pull out this code that we commented out when we were thrashing <laughs> there. Um, and then just just for kicks, let's to make sure that 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 if you were trying to access this from a different port, that it would fail. So remember, I made a change, so we need to build and run again, which we'll fix this in just a second too. We'll see how that's done. Okay, server's up and running again. We we're expecting this request to fail. Ah, and it does, just like we we were hoping it would. So it says XML HTTP request cannot load, no access control allow origin headers present. Basically what, what happens is our server needs to add that access control allow origin header that matches our domain, or it can be a wildcard to say that any domain is required or allowed. And because that's not there, the browser is saying you can't make this request. It's gonna fail. So that, that's just testing to make sure that, that we have this set up to, uh, to work correctly. So there, now we have cores, but what, what, that, what that is allowing us to do, just in case that, that got by you here, is that now we can leave our ASP.NET Core server up and running, and we can use the Angular CLI to host our Angular application. So we can say, not here, but here. This is uh, this is the Angular CLI hosting our Angular app. App we can browse to localhost forty two hundred, and that doesn't look different on the surface. But now we can do this. We can let's close these files. We can go into our client app, and let's let's just make us let's make a, a super simple change. 
So here's our app component, uh, ASP.NET is cool. Let's just, we'll say it's super cool. We'll save that and come back out and look at that. It, I didn't even have to refresh the page. It hot reloaded that component um, so that, you know, we're seeing the correct content again. That's what we were going for. Um, not having to do this, stop the server, do a build, you know, so that we can publish those files or deploy those files or with it. Uh, that business would get tired. So it was getting tiring just a couple times that we did it at the end of the last live stream. Um, so having your development uh, workflow set up correctly uh, is a super important uh, thing to do. Okay, so now we have, we're using the Angular CLI to serve our app, which as you just saw, we can make changes and it just reloads. That, that will help us a lot as with the rest of the live stream so that we're not wasting time, you know, building and refreshing. There's one more piece to this that we can do. Right, so we got the Angular CLI is being used correctly. We've got cores. Ah, we can do .NET Watch. So instead of having to stop and start, in, instead of having to do this uh, build and our .NET build, .NET run, every time that we make a change, we can actually enable .NET Watch which is a tool, a command line tool, sort of uh, an add-on, if you will, an add-on tool to the .NET CLI that will watch your file system. So if you make a change to the API, it will just automatically reload just like the Angular CLI is doing for us on the client side. So if we got that up and running, we could make a change to our API and it would automatically refresh or we can make a change to our client and it would refresh and that, that would be ideal, right? So again, this is not something that, that I do very often. So let's, I think this one will go quicker. So here's ASP.NET tools, various command line tools. Let's see if we can find what we're looking for here. Excellent.NET watch. Okay, so we need to install this tool. So we need to add this item group. So let's go back and this, this is, let's collapse this. This is over in our web app and we're gonna open that web app CS proj. Remember, this is our project file for our ASP.NET Core app. And we need to add an item group here. And this one is gonna be for .NET CLI tool references. And we're bringing in this Microsoft.NET Watcher Tools package version 1.0. We should, we'll need to do a .NET restore. Okay. And you can see here that it installed that package, which is great. Now, I believe it's it's simple as this saying .NET watch. So let's let's give it a go. So .NET watch. Oh, .NET watch. We have to. So you have to tell it what command you want to do. And in this case, it's either run or test. We don't have any unit tests in our project right now. So we'll say .NET watch run. Okay, so the watch is started. There's our server now. To test this, let's do this. Let's, um, we'll go back to our client app. We'll refresh the page, get video games. And we have our two video games there. And remember that's static in memory data. So if we come over to our API controller, remember that was just defined here in this list. Let's add a third video game. And when we save that file, because we're making a change here, we should see it. We should see it. Um, let's see, when did, when, did, when did the original Halo come out? 2000, 1999, something like that. Okay, so I'm gonna attempt to switch over to the console, save. Ah. See there, it noticed that we changed that file. It started. And now if we come back over here and click get video games again, now we see the third video game show up in the list. So this is exactly um, what we were wanting to do, right? So now we can just keep these console when our tabs open, these command uh, windows open or terminal windows open. So we can keep .NET watch run running here, which is watching our ASP.NET Core project if we make changes to it. And it will automatically build our project and restart the server. 
And we can also leave running ng serve our Angular so that if we make changes to the client app, it will do the same thing. It will compile our TypeScript to JavaScript. It will use Webpack to bundle everything and optimize it and make that available. And, and as you saw, refresh the browsers, browsers so we don't have to even do the manual control R, command R, control R to refresh it. So there we go. We have an improved development workflow. Uh, it will save us a lot of time. OK. Moving on, looking at my notes here, we fixed the fault file handling, we changed our dev approach. Um, we have some Im additional improvements to make to our API method, but let's do a quick time check. We're halfway through our time, so we started at 10. Uh, it's almost 11 o'clock right now. Uh, let's. So what I was gonna do is, is we, we have a couple of things in here, like for instance, I'm assuming that when you do a git and, and we, pass, we pass in this ID that we're going to find a match here. And if we don't find a match, I'm not doing anything about it. Um, so I would just be returning null here. Um, that's kind of clunky. It doesn't actually stop us from working on our application, um, but it's something that we'd want to fix. And here, set the ID value. Um, basically, when we're this is our post, our ability to add a video game. Um, since we're using in-memory data, we don't have like a database to, to give us what the next available ID should be for our record. So we're expecting the client to pass this in. So you know what, Let, let's go ahead and, and just take a quick moment to, to fix these things because it's, it's kinda, it kind of sucks the way it is right now, to be perfectly honest. So let's start here. So here... I'm basically using link, which is language integrated query in .NET to, it's a where oper filter operator. I can say where, and I get, this gets this anonymous function, our method, I get so mixed up between, switch between JavaScript and C sharp, my words get mixed up here. Um, this anonymous method, or Lambda, as we call them in C sharp and .NET, uh, will get called for every record, for every item in this video game's collection. So video game, that's what the VG stands for, video game.id equals ID. So we're doing we're doing a a comparison here. We're saying, hey, the ID that was passed into the get method, does that match the ID on this video game entity object? And if it is, that's the one we're looking for. It actually we're short circuit looping through the records. So if we had there go the lights again. If we had 200 records and our items in this collection, and the and the second item was the one we were looking for, it would stop on the second iteration through that collection. And then we say single or default. What this default does is, if it gets all the way to the end of the collection and doesn't find a match, it will return the default value for the video game class inside of our collection. It's it's a collection of video game objects. So we have, I, I call that a model or entity. We have a video game model or entity. And let's take a quick look at it. It's a really simple class. We have four properties right now. We have ID, title, published on, and platform. So going back to our, our git, if a match is not found, it'll be null. So we can actually just check for that. We can say if video game is null, then we can return not found instead of OK, because that's the not found as a 404 status code. If you aren't familiar with HTTP status codes, you can just Google HTTP status codes. Um, uh, oh, you know what? So this, this is um, w3.org. This is the official documentation, which is pretty good. Like it, it's not too difficult to read. Uh, MDM also has um, uh, the Mo Mozilla Developer Network. MDM is a great resource, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, this will also tell you um, what these status codes are and what they mean. So 200 is OK, meaning the request succeeded. And if we go to a 400, it means the client error response. And 404 specifically means it wasn't found. And so inside of our API, we can just use this convenience method. This not found method, if we put our cursor right on it and press F12, oh, of course, no definition found. 
Why is that? Well, all right, it tells us what, what it is right here. This is being defined in our controller base class. I'm not sure why it's not allowing me to navigate to it. It's kind of interesting. Um, creates an ASP.NET not found result that produces a not found 404. There's that status code response. So that's what we want. So that one was pretty easy to fix. Let's take a look at our next one. So, oops, didn't mean to zoom in so much there. Sorry about that. So inside of our post method, so again, this is for adding records. We're bound, so we can, we can use what's called model binding in ASP.NET Core to, to take the response, or the, excuse me, the request body, the message body, there's going to be data in there um, because this is coming from a client side application. It's going to be likely formatted as JSON, though it doesn't have to be. It could be form uh, encoded values, but it's going to be JSON in this case. Uh, we can say, hey, you know, that should be able to be mapped um, or translated over to a, one of these video game entity objects, which is what we're doing here. And we're saying that it comes from the body. It won't be in the query string, it won't be a header, it'll be in the message body. And please take those values that you find and attempt to map them to this video game object. Right now, we're expecting the client to tell us what the ID of the record should be, which really isn't their concern. The back end should be taking care of that. So first of all, I'm checking to see if the video game is not null. So the, the, this parameter that we're bound to, that we're expecting to be supplied to us, that has to have a value. So let's do this. Let's say if video game is null, we can return bad request. So bad request, again, if you come back to your status codes, 400. This response means the server cannot understand the request due to invalid syntax. Okay, that's good enough for now. I don't, does it allow us to pass in a message? I don't remember. Yeah, so we, we can we could actually pass in a message here. And you know, I'm not getting all of the IntelliSense that I thought I would be getting here. It looks like my stream. Huh, interesting. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna take the time to debug why that why that isn't working. Normally you should get some auto completion going on here. Um but I'm not. Let's double, well, now, now I can't avoid it here. I gotta go take a look here. Uh, so these are extensions that are installed with this version of Visual Studio Code. Um, it's not saying that we have any updates, I don't think. Yeah, I'm not saying that, that there's any updates. Is there any other, I don't know if something might be conflicting with it. It's really weird. Again, probably doing something really silly, um, but we're not going to bother trying to. I'm getting these reference counts here, so and I'm getting that, but I'm not getting what I was expecting. Is when I do an open parenthesis here, I was expecting a little tooltip pop up to show me the information about the method overloads that are available, and I'm not getting that. It's really strange. All right, so we're just going to return bad requests for now, but then we want to we want to set the ID. So now that we've check to see if if the video game is null we don't we don't need to check if it's not null here so let's just get rid of that conditional check um but how are we going to set the id again we're not we don't have proper data persistence at this point in time so you know we're going to do a hack <laughs> this is just to kind of get us over the hump if you will um and then we'll we'll you know, next week or the week after that, we'll add Entity Framework Core to this to this backend uh, application, and we'll actually use a database, and then we can remove this hack. So l let's call it what it is. We'll say hack uh, set. The, uh, I could have just changed the to do to a hack. Sometimes I just like the type. <laughs> so set the ID value, and the way that I'm going to do this is I'm gonna say, and because post is always gonna be a new record, I'm just gonna say video game dot ID, and then I'm gonna say video games dot count. So I'm gonna take uh, 
video games is it uh video games dot count plus one so what this would do then is if we had no items in the collection we would add one to it id would be set to one if we had in our case we have three items in the collection we would end up with an id of four that will work okay for now and then we'll add the video game Put and delete, we'll leave that alone for now because we're, we're not going to get to, to adding the edit and delete functionality to the client side app um, in this session. So we'll just go ahead and leave that. So there we have some simple changes. Oh, just saw that. We don't need that up there anymore. Excellent. Okay. So we fixed we fixed our not found so that you know let, let's let's use Postman to quickly test um, those changes and look at that so dot dot net watch dot net watch run is doing its job look at that how many times it's built and reloaded our application so let's let's pull up an application called Postman this is a it used to be a Google Chrome. Uh, extension, though I think they're running it locally as an application now, so uh, maybe they're using Electron like they do for the Atom editor and Visual Studio Code and whatnot. Not entirely sure about that. But what we can do is that we can we can use this to make some requests. So we can say uh, local host colon 5000 slash API slash video games we can choose what HTTP verb or method that we want, and then we can send this. And then we get our response back. Excellent. So now let's try retrieving. So I can do a slash one to, to get, now we're, we're, we should be trying to retrieve a single record. Excellent, so we got that back. But let's, let's ask for a record that doesn't exist. So we'll do slash five. And so we can see here, see if I can, yeah, of course I can zoom in. That'd make it a lot easier. Now we're getting 404 not found, which is our API in action. Awesome. And let's do this. Let's go back to our original request to get the list. I'm going to grab this little JSON snippet here. And then let's do a post. And we'll come over here to our body and say we're doing raw JSON. We'll post that in. We need another game. And we don't need to supply the ID. Let's see. So we did Mario Kart, Resident Evil, Super Mario 64. Oh, we don't have a Zelda <laughs> in there. So let's let's say the Legend of Zelda. Okay. And I won't even begin to to guess. Well, I'll just I'll say 1991. I didn't play the original versions. Is this an NES game? Yeah, I don't know. We'll just call it Legend of Zelda, sort of generically referring to the entire body of games. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay, so notice we're not passing an ID. So if we send this now, we get our 201 created, which is what we wanted. And look at that. Now we have an ID of four coming back. So the API did that logic of taking the count, which was three at the time, added one to it, gave us an ID. If we look over here in the headers, um, 201 created typically has a location header. We do. And it's giving us the URL, API slash video game slash four. So if we added a slash four up here and did not a post, but a git. Uh, no, what happened to, oh, there it is. It just scrolled off. And there is our get request JSON. So all that is working as we expect it to. Excellent. All right. So now let's let's kind of we'll, we'll, we won't completely ignore, but we'll move away from working on the API and we'll let's do some Angular. Um, and to start with, clicking the button to make the API request uh, that's like super clunky. If you if you navigated to a list page, you, you would just expect to see the list of records. So let's let's fix that. So let's we'll leave Postman up and running in case we need to come back to it. And we can jump out of there. 
think we're done with our web app for now. And let's go back over to our client app. Our client app, this is, it was, again, for those who, who weren't here, we used the Angular CLI to create this project. Um, so it adds a bunch of files for us on our behalf. I'm not going to take time to cover everything here right now. Uh, if anyone has any specific questions, feel free to fire away comments in the chat, and I'll, I'll go on those tangents and talk about those. Um, we also have a great course here at Treehouse, if you happen to be a Treehouse student, um, that will teach you uh, Angular as well. So if we come over here, let me, let me just show you that real quick. Treehouse library. Angular. It's Angular Basics. Don't we're not looking for Angular JS Basics. That's the previous version of the framework, which is quite different from Angular two. Or we're we're actually using Angular four now. Um, so this is the one that you're looking for. It's a three hour course that goes into you know how to create an Angular application from scratch. Um, great course. We'll give you a lot of great background that I'm not going to have time to get into all those details today. What we're looking to do is inside of source here, we have an app folder. Here's our index.html. You can see it's pretty simple. This app root element is where the Angular application is being mounted. Um, it's a custom element. If we go into our app folder and open up app module, this is, this is where the module, so all Angular applications are structured into one or more modules. We only have the one module because our application doesn't need any more than one module. If you were building a really large application, you, you could segment it into, or break it apart into modules and maybe that would you know, make sense. But we just have the one module. And then our app component, oops, not that file, this file. It's just a JavaScript, well, we're writing in TypeScript, but it's just a JavaScript class. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, so we can kind of, you know, it's just a JavaScript class. It has a decorator, which is a TypeScript thing that, that it, it adds to JavaScript. This decorator, uh, the two required pieces here are the selector and the template, um, either provided here as a string or the URL. It, it has to know what the, where the template is, and that's the, the view part of this, the, or the HTML. So the selector app root that is what maps then to this app root element in that HTML file. So if we look at this, so this is our app component. We only have that one component in our application that will change in just a bit. And then it's using for its template, this app component.html, it all lives inside of this app folder. And this is, this is the HTML markup. And you can see that we added this button with a click event binding, that's what these, the, the parentheses around click, the event, binds that event to a, a method on the component class called load video games. And so back on app component.ts, here's that load video games method that is using the HTTP service, which is provided to us as part of the Angular framework to make a get request Here's where it's calling. This is our local host 5000. That's our ASP.NET Core API. It makes a call to the API slash video games route. It takes when a response comes back, it maps that response and calls JSON to translate the data that comes back into JSON. And then we subscribe to it. This right here is known as an observable. Angular uses something a library called RxJS. RxJS, one of the fundamental building blocks, are observables. You can think of them sort of like promises. It's for asynchronous code. We, this HTTP get is asynchronous, meaning we, it, we don't know. This code executes before it, we don't know when the response comes back. So when a response does come back, we can, we can do things to it. In this case, we're mapping the response, turning it into JSON, and then we console log it. And that's what the subscribe does. If you're used to promises, this is the then method. Subscribe is, is similar to then for observables. So we console log that data, and then we say this.videogames. This.videogames is just an array. And back over in our component then, our template, 
we're taking an unordered list and we're using uh, a structural directive here, say ng4. So this star before the ng4 means that this becomes our little template. So for each item that's in this video games, it's going to generate uh, or render an li element with the title and these curly braces, this is um, an interpolation. Uh, uh, this is another type of binding. So we can basically interpolate the value of video game dot title right there into that li element content, its inner text or inner content. Okay, so all that being said, we have to click this button right now. We don't want to do that. So let's let's just let's just kill the button. We don't want that in there at all. Uh, and what we can do is we can use what are called lifecycle events. So we can say, we can bring in, so this import component comma, and now I added on init from Angular core. Uh, on init is actually an interface. So TypeScript allows us to create what are called interfaces. These are code contracts. And then we can down here in our class, we can say implements on init. That's how you say that a class implements the behavior that's defined in that on init interface. And you notice that as soon as we did that, now it says class app component incorrectly implements interface on init. Property ng on init is missing in type app component. So now it's expecting us to say we have something called ng on init. We can just take our, imp since video games is no longer being called from the template, we took out our button. We can just kill that, bring over our this dot h our HTTP dot HTTP service get method call into ng on init. What this ends up doing by defining this method on our component, the Angular framework at runtime looks to see if our component defines this method. And if it's there, it calls it. And it calls it when the component is being instantiated and initialized which is perfect because that's when we want to go get our data. And then when the data comes back, we set that to video games. So remember, oh, and we don't longer need, we're not, well, now we're still using map. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, we're using map down here. That's an RxJS operator. You can see that we're having to import that here. RxJS add operator map. RxJS out of the box doesn't include, it, they have a ton, dozens and dozens of operators. Um, you bring in just the ones that you want to use in order to keep your application um, dependencies as small as possible. Okay, so now that we've made that change, keeping in mind that the Angular CLI is running here in the background, so we have a new new set of bundles for us, and we should be able just to pop over to our client end. Look at that. It already refreshed. Our button is gone. So let's just, I'm just going to refresh the page just so you can see that now the data just displays as you would expect it to without having to click a button. So that, that's an important change. Um, simple one. Um, there's other lifecycle uh, hooks, for instance. You can, you can implement or, or, uh, the, the, the ng on destroy. So when your component's being destroyed, you can do cleanup and things like that if you need to. You can just actually Google. So if you search Google or Bing, <laughs> include that. So Angular uh, lifecycle hooks. And the first one, angular.io guide. Uh, this documentation goes into the lifecycle events that are available and how to use them. Um, really pretty solid documentation on that. So I encourage you, if you want to know more about lifecycle hooks, uh, check that out. Okay. So now that we've done that, um, again, another time check here. So 1120, what would be really great is to is to add an add form to our application. So let's, let's I'm going to take that out. We'll we'll clean this up and make it make it video game focused here. So I'm going to change my title to be video games. Okay. Excellent. And then let's double check that that's looking the way that we want it. Excellent. Video games. And here they are. Um, 
you know, the, uh, our app design, <laughs> look and feel of the app is, is not super awesome. Let's, you know, let's make a small change to that as well. Uh, let's say instead of, we'll just put this in a div, uh, another div, and we'll make this a div too. And instead of saying that's the title, let's just, we'll give that an H2. We already had an H1. What is, oh, slash H2. Okay. So now, come back here. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Not much of an improvement, but it's getting there. You'll see. Um, we also have, let's see, we have other properties available to us as well. So if we come back over, you know, that that's kind of a, a downside to our approach right now is that we don't have a great way of knowing what's available to us here from the TypeScript, from the uh, Angular side. We can come over to our web app and just go look at our model again. That's right, so we have an ID, title, published on, and platform. So let's add those to our the published on and platform to our display. So we'll do this as an H3, and here's our interpolation binding. So we'll say published on, and then what was the other one? Uh, platform. So we'll add that as an H3, we'll say video game platform. And actually we'll take the published on, let's, let's change that to an H4. Okay. What did I do? Oh, I'm missing my closing curly braces there. Okay. So that's a start. So Super Mario 64, you know what? Let's just take our let's just take our platform and display it. Usually like when you when you see a a shopping, you know, website, that's probably just going to be part of the title just so that's really easy to identify. And then we can put that in parentheses. So you can see why they they call these interpolations or interpolated bindings because you can mix them in with just static text. So here I'm wrapping that binding with parentheses. And now we're getting Super Mario 64 in 64, Resident Evil PlayStation. Look at our date. So that's the format of the date as it's coming across in a JSON. It's not exactly what we want it to look like, but we should be able to just say, we can use what's called a pipe. So we can take that, that value, that binded value, and pipe it into this. And now, look at that. Now we're getting January 1st, 19... This one probably deserves its own, like, to explain, so we can say published on. Excellent. And maybe H4 is a bit intense for that. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's change that to, I don't know, we'll say H5. And obviously we could go in and add CSS styles to this. Right now I'm just going to focus on the functionality, and we could go back and, and add you know, something to make it look pretty. And let's add a horizontal rule in here. There. All right, that's, you know, it's starting to look more like an application. <laughs> so little by little, right? Okay. So, oh, this, these date pipes. So let's see if we can pull up the documentation. So Angular 2 date pipe. When you're searching for documentation online, be really careful that you're not ending up at the Angular JS documentation, which is the previous version. You want to make sure that you're at Angular.io. Um, so always look for that when you look at your search results and you're looking for the official documentation. Uh, keep an eye out for that. So here's our date pipe, and you can see that 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 there's a lot of options available. In fact, we can include a format here. So what that looks like is that we can include a colon and two apostrophes like that. And then we can include one of these formats. So for instance, we could say medium. Let's just try medium and see what that looks like. And now we're getting 
that specific date format. What are some of the other ones available? Let's take a quick look. We can build custom ones too. So there's we can use these letters to construct a custom string. So for instance, we could say like month, day, year. Yeah, month, day, year. So let's try that. So we can say month, day, year. And let's make sure that I'm getting the casing right. Month, day, and then year is lowercase. Okay. There we go. Um, but it doesn't have its separators, so let's let's do that. And there we go. One one all of our in the in the API side, I'm using January first. So uh We'll leave it as that. So that's how you can do quick, easy date for our man. It's pretty cool that you can just do that from the template side. So if you're, you know, a developer who's working on the design of the application, you don't have to drop into code to do this. You can just work within the template, which is a nice separation of concerns. Okay, so let me see my notes here. Ah, so we improved the layout of our list page marginally. <laughs> Um, now we need an ad form. So the way that we're going to get to our ad form is we're going to actually set that up as like a separate screen or page in our application. Um, so let's do this. Let's, let's, we need to add routing to our application to enable that. Now, as it turns out, you can, when you use the ng command, uh, excuse me, yeah, the, oh, I created the tab in the wrong place here. So if you go to Angular CLI, and I always forget what the domain name is. Oh, really difficult to remember. CLI.angular.io. Um, if you load up that website, you can see here how simple the CLI is to use. You npm install it globally. You do ng space new space the name of you, what you want to call your application. And then you go into that directory in ng serve and you're up and running with a set of default files. That's what we did in the, in the previous live stream if you want to go check that out. Now, as it turns out, there when you say ng new, the name of your app, you can you can do dash dash routing, I believe is the switch to pass in. And that will, let's see what their documentation looks like here. So ng new, and then here, yeah, so you can pass in dash dash routing and it will add routing the routing module uh, to your project so you don't have to do these manual steps that we're doing now. Uh, that would have been great if I would have uh, done that up top. But let's let's go ahead and uh, we'll fix this. Now the 30 minutes has gone by. Hey, that's a way to keep track of time. The next time I know the lights go out, then we're done. <laughs> so... Okay, so uh, what I did is I went into package.json here in the root of, let me collapse some of these folders down. So client app, source client app, package.json. And what I was just double checking here was to see to make sure that we had the Angular router dependency is here. And it is here. Angular router is its own package. Um, so you need to make sure that you have that as a dependency in order to add routing. Now, uh, before the live stream, since I knew that I was going to want to do this, I actually went in uh, to basically a temp folder on my desktop, and I ran ng new dash dash routing, project name dash dash routing, to, to see the code that it added. So we could just kind of use that to quickly bring over, uh, you know, the code that it was going to add in here to make this work. So one of the things that it does is it adds another TypeScript file where you would define your routes. So I'm just going to follow this pattern. This is not the only way that you can structure your code, but since this is the CLI way of doing it, I'm going to just make that you know consistent um, in our application. So inside of, let's see, let me make sure I have it in the right folder. So that's in the app folder. So in our app folder, I'm going to add a new file. And that's called app-routing. Oops. So I'm going to add a new file. App-routing-module.ts. Because we're defining this inside of its own module, which is just you know creating another container 
for our routing definition, basically our configuration. And then we'll bring that in and add that or import that into our main application module. So I just copy and pasted that code over. Um, this is also very well documented on angular.io as well. And so you can just search for Angular routing and find that page and um, find how, all the steps to set all this up. So we import ng module because we're creating a module here. Uh, we import routes and router module from that Angular router package. And then here, here will be our routes. And so we need to configure. We're going to come back, though, and, and configure this. So to do configure routes. And then let's, let's I know that, that we also need to go in here and import our routing module from that module file. So let's go into our app module and add this import. So we're importing app routing module, which is the class from that new file, this, this guy right here, we're exporting that. So we're exporting it out of this JavaScript module. We can import that over here. And then we take that app routing module and where do we need to bring it in? We bring it in as an import. So our ng module has some imports here. And let's, we'll add it right there. So basically what this is doing is, is when we're configuring our main app module, we're saying that our app module is going to import or take it use or needs as dependencies, the browser module, this app routing module that we just added, forms module and HTTP module. Okay. And I think that's the only thing they did here. Yep. And I think that might be it. So let's, let's actually pull up the documentation for Angular 2 routing. Even though we're using Angular 4, I, I found that that if you put in Angular 2, because um, 4 is just a, a, it's a much smaller incremental jump. It's pretty much 2 with some new updates and, and improvements to it. It's not the same leap as it was from AngularJS 1 to Angular 2, by the way. But you can find lots of information about that uh, online. It helps make sure that you're scoping your, your, your searches down to the right thing. So here's the page that we're looking for. Um, Ah, so we do need to add this base href element to our index.html file. So let's do that. Oh, you know what? Look at that. They already added it for us. That's great. Uh, am I in the right? Yeah, I'm in the right project. I'm going to make sure that I was in the right place. Okay, so we added that. Um, we did our router imports as part of that new module that we're set up. And here's the configuration. Oh, and we need a router outlet. So router outlet, uh, it's, it's an element that the router module looks for. When we are moving from page to page or screen to screen, it's going to basically inject or display the component that's associated with that route into wherever this element happens to live. So what we want to do is inside of our app component, excuse me, inside of the template, we're just going to, to say, in fact, that's the only thing that's going to be in there. And we're going to end up moving. We're going to end up moving all of this list content into its own app component in just a second. OK. Oh, and then we'll need to set up some links. So we'll add that to our app component as well. OK. In fact, we only need we only need the nav part. I didn't need to bring all that over. Okay, so now we have our nav, and you define you use anchor elements, so just standard anchor element in HTML. But you use this router link attribute, which is what the Angular router is going to look for, and we're just going to this is going to to uh, be a route or a routing to the root. And we'll configure that. And we'll just call this, this will be our list of video games. And then we'll have another route called video games slash add. And this will be add video game. 
Okay, and remember, we're going to come back and we're going to move this to its own component, but we'll, we're going to leave it here just for now. And then we're going to go back over to our routing module, and now let's configure our routes. I'm going to put all of this on, I like to see that on, on one line, just a little bit easier for my eye to read. And then, right, so this path will say slash video games, and it's going to be component, and we need a reference to the component that we're going to associate with that. Well, like I keep mentioning, what we want to do is we want to set that up as a video games component, which doesn't exist yet, so we're going to have to add that in just a second. And then here, video games, oh, excuse me, video games ID and then we're going to say this is uh, video games about video game add component. Okay, so we have a couple of components that we need to add. So let's add them. And we're gonna use the Angular CLI to do that. You can see our Angular CLI ng serve has been running and so now we're getting errors over here that it can't find those components so we're getting the errors that we're seeing over here in visual studio code are the same errors that we're seeing out here so we're going to go ahead and stop ng serve we're still on the root of our project but now we can say ng generate component and i'm trying to i believe you use kebab casing here so we can say video games. Okay. And that created in source in the app folder a video games folder and inside of that video games dot, dot component and it added a CSS file and HTML for the template spec which is our unit tests and the component itself. And if we pop over here and look here's our video games folder if we open up the component yep so we have video games component. Look at this, it added our, our starting point for our component. This is why we love the CLI. It makes our life easier when we're trying to build out an application. So let's go ahead and add our, what do we call it? We were saying video game add. So back out here. So video game dash, video dash game dash add. And now we have our second component. Okay. Now our routing module is still unhappy, but we haven't imported them now. Remember, everything is every file is scoped to its own JavaScript module. So now we need to import video games component from. And where are we at? So this app routing module is sitting as a sibling to the video games folder. So we could say video games, and then the name of the file is video games component. And of course that doesn't work. Uh, what am I missing here? Cannot find module video games. Okay, we're, so I'm in app routing module and I'm trying to go into video games, video games. Man, I'm not, oh, duh. I need to say that I'm starting from the current directory and then slashing into video games. So just a simple syntax there. And then let's do the other, we'll say video game add component. And so this one is video game add, video game add component. Okay, so now we've imported both of those components. The error went away, and so we're mapping our path slash video games to the video games component and video games slash add. Excellent. So let's, let's see, let's do ng serve to run or to build and run the development server and let's let's just see if we can can browse or navigate to those 
those routes and see those components. Okay, excellent. We can close that date pipe. We don't need that anymore. Okay, and we're getting an error. So it says, invalid configuration of route view gains. Path cannot start with a slash. Oh, okay. My mistake. You just do that. Okay, excellent. So let's see if we can get to video games add. Okay, so this is a little confusing because we haven't, we, I forgot to move my content. So let's, let's go over to our app component. Remember, we had this content in here. So we need, we need to move that so the only thing that's going to be in our app component are our our navigation and this router outlet, which is think of it as a placeholder. This is where those components that are being associated with those routes are going to get rendered or injected to. So then we can come to our new video games component. Actually, that was the so we can bring in the that portion of it, but then we need to go into the code part as well. And let's see, so we can bring, actually, let's let's bring this entire thing over and then we'll remove the pieces out of this that, that we don't want. That probably would be the easiest thing to do. Oh, no, that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> so let's, let's bring in our imports. Okay. I didn't want to lose our component decorator settings here. That would have blown those away and I didn't want to have to go back and and add them. So then we'll just grab, we'll grab uh, this, uh, I guess we're already implementing on in it. Yep. And so we can just grab the implementation of our class and we can blow this away there. Okay, so now just to, to, to you know, review what we just did there. We took our implementation of our old implementation of our app component and we brought it over to our video games component, which is going to be the component that renders our list of video games. You know, I think everything here just goes away, like like our app component, um, and it no longer implements on in it. So we can get rid of that. We can, let's just do some cleanup here. We can get rid of that. Uh, we're not using the HTTP client here, so we can get rid of those imports and we can get rid of the RxJS. So our app component just got to be very, very lightweight <laughs> by comparison. But now we've taken all that list presentation out of there. So if we come back over to our app, now we're, we're uh, here we go. Localhost 4200 slash video game slash add. And now we're seeing the content that's in our video game add t component template. And that's all that it says right now. This is where we'll add our form. And then if we click on video games, oh, we get nothing because it's trying to go to root, but we haven't configured what root should be. So we have to manually say slash video games. Now we can fix that. We can actually create a fallback and I think what we do is we we do a wildcard match, and then I have to go look at the documentation of this because again I do this. Yeah, here it is. No, we do empty path. So empty path and a redirect, and then we'll do a page not found component. We'll we'll show you how that works as well. Oops. Just want to grab that portion. And then we'll add one more component, which is our page not found content. We could put in a fun, friendly page not found page at some point. So now we're saying if the path is empty, meaning they're trying to, to do root, then we're going to redirect them, redirect to, and this could be any path, but basically we're just rewriting the path so that it will match this. And the order, I didn't say this, but the order of these these paths are really important. The processing comes top to bottom like this. So you, you want to make sure that you put these catch-alls at the end and not at the beginning, or you'll see some strange behavior. 
Then we have a wild card. So after everything else that we're like we're saying, here's here's our our known routes. At the end, we want to match against anything else, and we're going to map that to a page not found component. So again, we need to so we'll stop our server. We'll do ng generate. I'll bring this up. So ng space g. We're creating a component, and we'll say page not found. Okay. And then we can ng serve, and while that's starting up, we need to import that new page dot not found component that we just added. So page not found from page not found slash page not found dot component. Okay. And now that's happy. And so now what we can do, well, let's, let's go in and, and update our page not found content real quick. And we can, let's see, we'll give it a title. So we'll say H1. Oops. Oops, page not found. And then it's like, sorry, we couldn't find that page. Okay. So now over here in our app, I'll make this window a little smaller. We click on video games. We should be able to we should be able to just do forty two local host forty two hundred slash. And now we get redirected to the video games route. We can click on add video game and we can go there. But now let's try let's let's say we're trying to browse to video games slash edit. And now we see our oops page not found. Sorry, we couldn't find that page. Pretty cool. So that we've got a basic setup of routing and we could add our edit route um, later on as well. Um, but that gives us a way to, to create some navigation. And to be clear, um, even though it looks like we're, we're browsing across pages here, we're not. This, this is still a single page application. Um, basically, Angular is hooking into those, those navigation events and modifying the browser history, doing all that. So we, we can actually use the back forward buttons um, like you would expect to. And it looks like we're navigating around a, a, a server-side rendered website with this request response loop happening, but we're not. It's all client-side, which keeps it really snappy um, and really responsive. Okay, so now we have our navigation. Um, our add video game uh, is, well, we don't have our form yet. So I think that was the next thing, yep, was to add a form to add new items. So let's do that. We have <laughs> 12 minutes to build a form. Uh, we, might, we might go a little over. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. OK. We're not in our web app. We're not in page not found. Video game add. Let's start, let's start with our template. So we'll say an H1, add video game, and then we're just going to create a form. Oops, no, I don't want ng form. I just want a form. So we just end up creating a regular old um, HTML form. So we'll create, we'll wrap our fields in a div, we'll give them labels, and then we'll do inputs. So this will be a label for, so let, now I need to remind myself again what our model looks like. So let's go over to our web app. That's right, so we have uh, title, published on, and platform. So basically what we're gonna do is we're going to add a field for each of these things. So I'm going to go ahead and just drop three of those in there. We're also going to have a button whose type will be 
submit and then we'll say add video game for its content okay our first field this will be for uh, not name for title and so we'll, we'll give this an ID of title oops type text that looks fine we'll self-close that next one will be published on for and let's see oh we need to give these content to as well so this this will be title published on and we're actually let's let's change the type of this to be date because that's what it is it's a date and then we'll change its ID here so we'll say ID equals published on and let's self close that as well this one then will be platform and its ID will simply be platform so ID equals oops not platform platform and that's just text as well um, Ideally, we'd want this to be a select list because we just probably wouldn't want them to type anything in here. Um, we would we would want them to pick from a, a, a list of items. So, um, Amen, yeah, hello. Thanks for the, the chat message. And you asked, hey, do you think you could do a video on Python? Um, yeah, you know, we, we do a lot of live coding with Python when Kenneth is here <laughs> and this week, uh, actually, the next six weeks, um, so Pi, uh, Kenneth is on sabbatical, so uh, you have me for the next three weeks, and I'll be focusing on working on this ASP.NET Core Angular application, um, and then we'll have Alina Holligan, our PHP teacher, is going to be doing something around, I believe, PHP Web Frameworks for three weeks, and then you'll get Kenneth back, and Kenneth will be doing a lot more Python, so sorry about that, but, but that's... Uh, um, we're going to have a, a change in pace here for a little while. So button type submit, add video game. Okay, so we can get rid of this. Okay, and then let's go take a look at our Angular form documentation. There's a couple different ways that, that you can do forms inside of Angular. Um, you'll notice here that we there's a template driven, which is the one that we're going to be using. And there's also reactive forms, which we won't be covering today. Um, so template driven forms. All right, we don't need that. Uh, so what I want to double check here is just our simple template. OK, form. Yep, we got our IDs. We're not using, we, we don't have any styles, so we don't need anything of that nature yet. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't have a select list yet, so we don't need to do that. Um, we will, we will do this though. We will add our, to our video game component here. Let's, you know what, we don't have, what we're missing here is we don't have a model for a video game. So we have our model on our server side, but we need a model on our client side as well, ideally. So let's let's do this. I'm just gonna add, for the time being, I'm just gonna add that right in line here. And so I'll say uh, class video game. And what we want this to look like is we want it to look like, and I already closed it, so we'll see. We had, I'll just do it from memory. So we had uh, an ID, right? And we had a title, which will be string, and the ID was a number. And then we had published on was a date. And then we have, oops, not a comma, semicolon. These are all properties on, on this class. And then we had platform, which will be a string. This is TypeScript. Um, if we were doing this as JavaScript, you wouldn't need to specify the types, but here we're going to go ahead and and specify the types. Then we can come down here now that we've defined this class, and we can say we can say model, 
So this is a property on our component now, and we can say it's going to be of type video game. And then in ng on init, we can say this dot model equals new video game to instantiate a new instance of that video game. Now with that in place, we should be able to come back over here and we should be able to, to do some bindings. So what we can do is we can say ng model and then we can bind this to title. Oh, and it's model.title. And ah, check that out. That is so cool. Now that we've, we've added a model property that's strongly typed to our video game class, we're getting IntelliSense in here. It knows what properties are available on that model, which really helps us make sure that we um, are binding to the correct thing. So this strange looking syntax, so there's, there's a few different types of bindings um, in, in Angular. You can do property bindings, you can do event bindings. Uh, so here, when you do square brackets, that's a property binding. And when you do curly, or not curly braces, but parentheses, then that is an event binding, which means you're binding an event from the template to the component. And so the property binding is one way from the component to the template. So here we're using both, meaning that it's a two-way binding. So if we change model.title on the component side, it will update the value here and vice versa. When we change it inside of the input element, that value is going to, to show up um, or be put into that model.title property in our component. So let's go ahead and we need to add ng model bindings to our other input elements. Okay. So this one will be date, uh, it's published on, excuse me. And this one will be platform. And then down here, let's do this. We'll, we'll do a pre and then we'll do an interpolated binding and we'll say um, model. And then we'll pipe that in to the JSON pipe. So we'll see that, that video game model displayed as JSON on the page. Let's see where we're at right now. Okay. Oh, and we're getting an error. So what, if ng model is used within a form tag, either the name attribute must be set or the form control must be defined as standalone. Okay, so we, I left out the name attributes. The name attribute is being used uh, to reference that field in, in the form. So uh, they need to be there. That was my oversight my misremembering that that needed to be done. So let's say name platform. Okay. Excellent. And so now if we, let's see, so uh, what's another video game? Uh, oh, let's say, well, what is Zelda? So now as you see, as we change the value here, the binding, the two-way binding is updating from the input element over to our component and setting our title. Um, we also can use the date picker to pick a date and we're getting a published on date here and we can set the platform. Okay, that is a pretty decent starting point. Now we need to handle like nothing's happening when we say add video game. So now we need to handle submission. And we do that at the form level. And so this is going to be an event binding. And I think it's, it's just submit that we're looking for. And this, so, so on, we'll, we'll add a method. So what this is saying is the form submit event, bind to that and call on submit on our component. And we're getting an error because we haven't defined what that method is yet. So if we come over here, then we can add on submit. Now, if we come back over to our template, it should refresh and find that. Maybe you have to reload the template. No, oh, there it goes. It just took a second, I think, to, to recompile our application and, and uh, so it, it knew that it was available. Okay, so now here, 
we can we can call the API to post our data. Okay, and if we this loads, let's add our title, our date, and our platform. And if we click add video game down here in the console, we're seeing call the API to post our data. Okay, so the event's working as we expect, but we now we need to do something about it. Well, we need to use, just like we used our, the HTTP service to retrieve a list of records, we need to get a reference to our HTTP service um, to, to use it to post data. So we can say, and I'm gonna go grab from our video games list, grab this import. Okay, so now what this did in our constructor, we can basically request from the dependency injection container that Angular provides. We can say, hey, please provide to us an instance of the HTTP service because we need to use it. And then, oops, sorry. Here we can say this.http post and it wants a URL and it also wants a body. I believe that we'll need to, here, let's do this, finish. I'm gonna to subscribe to that because remember this is an observable, so we need to subscribe. But we, we need our body and I think Let's double check this. I, I think we need to JSON, JSON encode our model. There's a new HTTP client. I was gonna switch this over to using that that does that automatically. Um, we're using the previous version and, and I don't remember off the top of my head if it, did, if it does it for you automatically. Let's, let's just pass in our model and see if that works. And so our URL is local and this is, a really hacky way of doing this. We probably ought to have configure use configuration to specify what our API's um, base URL is <laughs> instead of having to do this. That's okay. And so video games. So localhost 5000 slash API slash video games. We're posting the model for that. And then here, let's um, Let's go ahead and just we'll console log a statement right now. Added video game. And let's see if we can post. We'll improve upon this in just a second, but let's see if we can get now why am I just drawing a complete blank on a video game? So how about uh Overwatch? I actually have never played Overwatch before, but I know that that's a that's a game. So Xbox One <laughs> And then we'll add the game. Oh, okay, so response to preflight request doesn't pass access control check. Ah, interesting. So uh, we're, we're getting, oh, interesting. So it, our cores, our cores configuration is failing us. <laughs> it's not allowing, it's not allowing the post to happen. So let's, Let's review what's going on there. Okay, so we have post. There's nothing about that. So let's go into startup. And then let's try adding. So builder with any origins dot. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, wrong place. Allow any method. Let's try that see if that will and let's make sure shouldn't take too long to there we go our server we rebuilt and our server is starting because remember we have dotnet watch run up and running and because we didn't leave the page we can just try posting this again 
No, nope. and we got the same error again. Okay, so why is that not? Response to prefile doesn't pass control check. No access control allow origin headers present on the requested resource. So it's interesting. It's still not, it's still not allowing me to. Hmm. Let's try one more thing. Allow any header. Okay, I would think that that would be pretty lax. It would allow everything at that point. Okay, so it looks like it restarted. Ah, okay, so not only, that's interesting. So it must have been looking for a request header that wasn't there. Let's let's go take a look at what headers were being sent. Cause that, that's, I would have thought that it would have, that Chrome would have been following some sort of standard header name. But let's go take a look at that request. Um, okay, ah, so it's sending an options here. So the options verb basically is a pre-flight. So the git wasn't sending the options, which is, it's, you know, git's not as, as harmful or potentially as harmful as, or shouldn't be harmful, right? This retrieving data, but the post is, is modifying data. So it's doing, it. the browser was doing a pre-flight check to see if that was going to be allowed. And that pre-flight check was failing. Uh, the request header Let's see if we can find. So it was using origin, which is pretty standard. So I'm going to guess that that we just needed to to basically open that up to allow the options verb um, in combination with this specific header uh, in order for our configuration of our API to to know how to, or to allow you know how Chrome was trying to do that. Okay, so it added the record, but um, we didn't go back to the view against page. So let's see if it's here. And look at that. We now have Overwatch in our list. So the last thing that I want to do is it's kind of clunky that you that you have to like manually browse um, to get back to the list page. So let's do this. Let's after we post, instead of console logging that, let's get a, a reference to the router object. So let's import router, well, router module. So at Angular router. And then let's ask for an instance of the router. So we'll use dependency injection for that. So we'll say router, router. Okay. Then in handling the, the post in the subscribe, we can say this dot router navigate. And then here we can, is it navigate? Oh, no, and no, no, we were right. So it's, it's an array. Then inside of here, then we just, we, we navigate to, we could send them to the root but we, we know more specifically that it's slash video games is where we want them to go. The reason why this ends up being an array is that if we needed to pass a value as well, then, then we could add that parameter value. But this specific route is just the path. There isn't any, any um, router parameter values that we need to pass. So we're back out here in our list. So let's add one more video game. So let's see, oh, got to have another another title here. Uh, oh, Sonic. Let's give Sega some love. <laughs> Pick a date, and then uh, let's say that this is on uh, Dreamcast. And it's not just Sonic, it's Sonic Adventure. Great game. <laughs> and then we'll add, and what we expect when we press add is that we'll, we'll be redirected or routed to the video game's uh, route, we'll see our list of video games with the video game on there, and there it is. Awesome. So how do we know that this isn't just some trickery on the client side? Well, we're not adding that record to an array, some global array of records, so that's one thing that you should know. But let's let's go back out to Postman, and we'll just do a, a git on video games. 
we're using Postman just to hit our API directly, and we can see all of our data down there with our IDs and everything. So that's pretty cool. We now have a way to not only list our records, but we can add them as well. Um, so let's see here. The one thing that we didn't get to do is having platform as an input field, it definitely feels a little clunky to me. Um, you know, that that's probably a field that, that really would benefit from being constrained, you know, so that we'd have a select list and you would pick which platforms are available because there's only a set number, even if there's a dozen or more, um, it's a pretty limited list and we, and we can make it easier in our users by just making that a select list. So that would be something that we could cover in the future if that's interesting. Uh, other changes we could do, we could switch to using the new HTTP uh, module service. Um, it's a little bit nicer to use. Um, so that could be interesting as well. Um, we also don't have any validations. On our form, you can just basically attempt to submit an empty record uh, and it would happily do that. So notice that we ended up with a record with no data. So we don't want to allow that. Not Our API should validate the data, but our client side should also give the user feedback. So validations is something that we'll definitely cover in the future as well. Um, and then persisting data to an actual database so that when we start stop our application, um, we don't lose our records. Because right now it's all in memory. If I were to stop, in fact, let's, let's see an example of that. If I go over to .NET, Control C to stop this guy, and then restart it. And then we reload our, our client side application. Notice that we're back to our original list. We lost all those additions that we did. A database would fix that problem for us. That's how we should be building it. Uh, so that would be something else that we would need to, to take uh, into account. Uh, we also had a request um, in our last session about adding authentication. If we're going to allow people to add records, it'd be great to know who, in fact, they are. Um, so we could use, you know, like um, Google, for instance, um, OAuth to be able to uh, identify who they are. They could log in with their Google account and. Uh, or you know Facebook or Twitter or whatnot, and and be able to use that as a way to to give them access into our application and to be able to add records. And if they don't log in, they can't add records. That'd be something else to to work on. Um, we haven't really talked much about TypeScript, RxJS. There's just a lot of like information in there to know about as those pieces work inside of Angular. So that'd be something else. So I guess the bottom line is is uh, chat. Let us know what would be interesting to cover next week and the week after. Um, or tweet at us and let us know. And if you don't give me any ideas, then I'll follow uh, my own instincts. And we'll see you guys next week um, with more live coding. And we'll basically be picking up where we left off today. And we'll continue working on making this application better and better. So thanks for taking time and hanging out with me. And uh, have a great weekend. And we'll see you soon.